Good morning. Welcome. Uh, we want to welcome all of you here. Some of you know me, some of you don't. I'm Pat Slattery, longtime resident of Lunenburg, longtime member of the Historical Society. Currently, it's present. And uh, joined today by other members of the society, with Bill Tyler, the curator, Eileen O'Brien, uh, vice president, and where's Ann? Ann, oh, Ann is yeah. there. Ann Nelson, who is one of our valuable uh, researchers <clears throat> and volunteers. And Bill will make a a pitch at some point to get more volunteers because we could certainly use them. Uh, we're doing great things at the Historical Society. If you haven't been there recently or at all, uh, you should stop in. We're open Wednesday mornings from 9 to 12 and currently Saturdays 9 to 12 also. So we, uh, <clears throat> we've expanded the hours. We're bringing in more activity, more people. And an example of that is this program, which is the first uh, that we've had here at the now Adult Activity Center. Um, it, like the Historical Society, has gone through a series of uh, permutations. So now we're at the Adult Activity Center, mm -hmm. and this will be the first program in what's anticipated to be four programs over the next few months. <clears throat> and those will complement the four programs that we generally have at the library throughout the year. So, uh, so we're getting out there, we're getting out to town and uh, bringing the Historical Society to you folks. We'd very much like you folks to come to the Historical Society and participate. Uh, let's see. Some of the new initiatives that we've begun uh, <clears throat> are a complete update and inventory of all of the artifacts that we have, of which there are many. I think at last count there's something over 1,500 individual artifacts at the, uh, at the Historical Society. We've <clears throat> started putting together a comprehensive database of all of those pieces. And over the years, as, as things have happened, uh, different people looked at inventories in different ways. And so we've got kind of a hodgepodge of, of different approaches. And we're streamlining that into a computerized database with photographs. We'll have all of that information available. In addition, we have numerous maps, a multitude of books. <clears throat> as well as what we term mixed media, which are CDs, DVDs, cassette tapes, uh, videotapes of projects like this coming and, uh, and speaking. So there again, we're <clears throat> streamlining all of that. Everything will have a place and uh, be in its proper place if you need to come and, and, uh, and utilize it. We also <clears throat> have recently uh, enabled a membership with Ancestry.com. So if anyone uh, who's a member would like to access Ancestry.com to do genealogy study or whatever, we're the place to come. All good. Um, <clears throat> I made some notes because I always skip over things. Um, Bill will address the volunteers. We need volunteers, so I've covered that. Um, today's program is about the building we're in. And, and there's uh, a picture. You'll be amazed at the, uh, the various phases that it went through in its lifetime. And uh, so my effort here today simply to introduce the A-team, who's Bill Tyler, our curator, and Eileen O'Brien, our vice president. Um, they're like the energizer bunnies of history in Lunenburg. So, uh, so I'm really pleased to be able to turn the program over to Bill. Thank you, Pat. 
as Pat mentioned, um, at the end of the program, um, I should say that the program is going to be divided into a couple, two sections. Um, my section is going to be concentrated basically on the building itself and its transformations over the years. Um, and uh, we'll have a brief, not an intermission, but when I'm done, we have to change programs here a little bit and hopefully there's no computer glitches. Um, and I'll uh, have Eileen come up and do her program, which is basically on the Bellows family itself. Um, she is the utmost expert, as far as I'm concerned, on, on Lunenburg families. Um, so um, that'll be her part. Um, and at the end of everything, we will expand a little bit on what Pat said about looking for volunteers and, and things like that. And, and while the program's going on, if, if you guys would like to think about um, maybe some programming you might be interested in, in seeing here. Um, like I say, we have a treasure trove of old uh, videos and things, so we're always looking for ideas. Um, this program seems to be a no-brainer as far as the first one about the building, but you know, it's a kind of a blank slate of anything you guys want to want to see a program about. Um, you know, slip, slip us a note, let us know, and uh, we'll see if we can do it. So, with that being said, <clears throat> thank you for the giving us this, this opportunity uh, to share some of this building's history through a series of old images that we have in our collection. This building has had more uses um, in town than any other building that I'm aware of. Um, to me, the amazing part of it is the transformation um, that it went through, um, as you'll see in the next slide. <clears throat> this is actually the, what the original bellows, called it a mansion, mansion house, looked like. Now, uh, it wouldn't include any of this portion here. It's just the main, like the, the front of the building where the pool table is and all that. Um, it had a barn, it had a, uh, like a carriage house. Um, so basically it was a, it was a typical colonial style um, home. Um, as nearly as we can tell, it was built between 1730 and 1737. Um, Ephraim Weatherby, another old Lundberg name, presumably the builder, but that's always up for debate. Um, as Eileen might, might touch on, she has some ideas too. Um, the truth is no one really knows, no one really can specifically say, you know, back then they didn't have plans and things like that, so I mean, there's no, no one knows for sure, but I guess you can surmise it's probably one or the other. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, Ephraim Weatherby sold a 65-acre lot in Mansion House in Byron to Benjamin Bellows on July 18, 1737. The house originally had four rooms, two up and two down. The back rear rooms were under a sloping roof, but the house was built as many others at that time as a story and a half or called a salt, back, salt box style. There were probably at least two or more fireplaces, one with a brick oven in the center of the house. Fast forwarding a little bit, uh, it remained in the Bellows family till about 1785. And a succession of owners were Thomas Dawes, Caleb Prentice, and Josiah Storn, Stearns. It was used as a grocery store and a library over those years. Josiah Stearns' daughter, Anna, and her husband, Benjamin Snow, acquired the property in 1862. After Benjamin Sr.'s death, his son, Benjamin Jr., took over the ownership, and in 1883, made the extensive renovations and additions that turned the old house into a modern Victorian hotel with 14 rooms, the first telephone in town, hot and cold running water, electric bells, and a bowling alley, believe it or not. <laughs> Benjamin, Benjamin's cousin, Timothy Snow, was hired as the manager of the hotel, and the business needed a name for advertising. Because of the weather vane on the roof, the name Eagle House was chosen. And on this next slide, we'll show you the transformation from this to that. <clears throat> this, this photo is uh, from a collection called the, um, the House Brothers. Um, it was from a glass negative, and the House Brothers were, a, uh, were two brothers that lived out in Western Mass, and they traveled the whole, uh, all of Massachusetts, 
and one of their uh, trademarks when they um, took photos of houses was to include the whole family. I mean, people, uh, dogs, cats, horses. Uh, you, you can always tell their photographs because the whole family's in it. This particular one, um, I don't really have any idea who, I, I'm, I'm surmising that might be um, uh, Mrs. Longley, who later on in the next slide I'll show you, they, had a, they turned it into it was an hotel, but I don't know for sure that's who that is, but I'm surmising that's who it is. Um, so you can see the renovations, I mean, it doesn't resemble what, what the first house, um, I mean, if you, can, if you can visually eliminate the dormers and that cupola and, and all the ornate things, you can basically see the style of the, of the house, but it's, it's, very, it's very different, for sure. <clears throat> now, the Longley family, um, Charles Longley became the owner in 1888. He and his wife continued in the hotel business for a number of years. The property passed through several owners, including Ralph Whitcomb, until it was finally acquired by Arnold Dickinson in, in 1935. Now, this is another photo that we have in our collection, and the date's wrong, but that's another good view of it. You can, you, you can actually see the original lines of the house a little bit better in this photo. Um, again, if you can just visually eliminate all the other things that are going on in that house right now, you can kind of see the basic, basic lines of the house. <clears throat> another favorite image of mine, this is um, probably from the 4th of July celebration. Um, back then, um, they used to have what was called Old Home Week. Um, and the town celebrated all week long with different events and uh, so forth. And all the town buildings were all uh, decked out in um, bunting. Um, we have a lot of photographs of other town, you know, the, uh, the town hall and the library. Um, hopefully, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the 300th anniversary uh, in 17, I'm sorry, 17, 19, uh, 2028, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, I'm on the committee with nine other people, and um, so it would be great to see all these old buildings, the ones we have left anyway, decorated like this. <clears throat> In 1937, the house and land was given to the town by the will of Charles Dickinson, with a provision that it be given to the American Legion post and be used as a Legion home and war, war memorial. As part of a WPA, the Works Progress Administration project, the second renovation took place, and the building was moved from Main Street to its present location, and a new roadway was created from Main Street to Mass Ave called Memorial Drive. Now, if this building originally was sat on where the, basically where the Boys and Girls Club is, um, so directly behind that, you can see that White House, that's, that's the, uh, the Jones House. So you can, you can kind of get a lay of where, where it's at. So this next photo um, shows it all jacked up um, with the beams underneath it, um, preparing for the move. And you can see, um, again, going back to the original house, again, this is even easier to see. If you take away all the other things on the house, you can kind of see the, the original form of the house. Mr. Dickinson had the house stripped of all its ornate decorations and restored to a simple colonial lines. Two fireplaces were added as well. You can see the fireplace on one side and the fireplace on the other side. This building has been used over the years as a meeting place for town groups. It was also the first home of the Lunenburg Community Federal Credit Union. It was also used in the summer by the Park Department for Arts and Crafts. In 1986, the building was renovated again to become the Eagle House Senior Center. I hope you've enjoyed this visual history of this wonderful building. Um, so at the, this time, I'm gonna just switch gears a little bit and I'm gonna uh, have Eileen come up and, and uh, give you the, the uh, scoop on the Bellows family. Just bear with us for a moment. <laughs> I was a bad girl today. I didn't bring the right do paper to connect my computer to the thing, so. I, got, I had sent Bill a program, an old one, so I'm kind of doing it from the old program that I uh, started a couple weeks ago, but I keep changing things. I'm like a you know, busy bee when I start doing slides for the program and change this, the colors and everything, but uh, I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, 
the Bellows family uh, were originally from Lancaster, and uh, I'm sitting with Benjamin Bellows the first, and they're a whole bunch of Benjamin Bellows. So, and they, of course, when he has a son, and he names it Junior. Then the next, he has a son, and he names it Junior. So, I kind of go by Benjamin Bellows one, Benjamin Bellows two, and so on and so forth. But um, okay, this, when you send the slides from a Mac computer to a PowerPoint, it kind of rejiggers it. Uh, but why I would be bellowing about the bellows is that when I first started researching them, I discovered that uh, a lot of the stuff was written about them by members of their family. <laughs> so instantly you say, well, how much of this am I going to believe? Um, it's always good stuff. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, let me see, uh, which way do we go here, Bill? Enter? Enter. Okay, um, Benjamin Bellows was born to a woman named Mary Bellows, and her parents were John and Mary. And Mary was not married when she had Benjamin. Uh, and her, what happened in those days was, if you were not married and you had a child, uh, the midwives who attended the birth were taken to court and while they were helping you have a baby, they were interrogating you as to who the father was. Uh, this led to a problem because lots of women would say that rich guy over there <laughs> is the father. So they kind of gave up on that after a while and they would just pursue the woman and they would take her to court and they would charge her with fornication. This was all, she was also brought up if she was a member of the church congregational church in the town, she would have to get up in front of the church and admit her sin. If a couple who were married had a child before the nine months was up, they also had to admit <laughs> they had admitted fornication. So, and what happened, it's very, Mary was summoned five years. They finally found her. Family hid her after she had the baby. And it took five years for the courts to catch up with her and actually summons her to court uh, to answer to the charge of fornication. And so Benjamin starts off life in a very bad circumstance. Uh, neither Mary, his mother, nor whoever his father was, had any legal obligation to support him or have anything to do with him. And that was because the courts wanted to protect the legal heirs of the family. Um, but Benjamin, something would have happened with Benjamin. Either the family would have found some place to send, they might have kept him for a few years. They probably indentured him to another family. Even as they, babies were indentured to other families. And sometimes the families loved them, sometimes they didn't. Uh, but Benjamin seems to have been pretty fortunate. Whatever happened to him, by the time he was in his teens, at least the family stories say that he had acquired a pair of oxen and he was making money. And he ends up as an inholder in Lancaster. Now, the part of Lancaster, Lancaster was a huge town. Uh, Clinton, uh, parts of Ayer, Bolton, Harvard, these, Lancaster was called a mother town for a lot of these places. And Benjamin Bellows was in that park that is now Harvard, I don't know if you know, what, I think it's Stillwater Road that leads up from 117 up to Harvard Center. That's where they lived. There was another family that lived there. Um, Major Simon Willard was a very, very famous person in early Massachusetts. He arrived he had military knowledge and he saved a bunch of people during King Philip's War who had been attacked by Native Americans. And he galloped in and, you know, <laughs> saved them all. Um, so this Willard family was very important in Lancaster history too. And so Benjamin's evidently acquiring money. He has an 
in, he's an inholder in Lancaster and that part of Lancaster, which is now Harvard or Bolton. And he finds a rich widow <laughs> who is 12 years older than he is, uh, Doris Cutler Willard, who is ma was married to Henry Willard, who was supposedly the richest man in Lancaster and the son of Simon Willard. When Simon Willard did all these great things for Massachusetts, they gave him big land grants. So he became quite wealthy, and Henry was his son, and Henry was very wealthy. Henry dies. Dorcas has a bunch of kids. She marries a man 12 years younger than she is. Uh, Evan, now, it wasn't great to be illegitimate. Everybody knew it. Everybody knew who you were. You could not escape that. And all of these towns were kind of had, you know, Rotten, Lancaster, eventually Lunenburg. Everybody knew everybody else, and they were moving in from these towns. So, but um, they have four children, um, and they leave Lancaster. Uh, Benjamin is selling all this land that he now owns in Lancaster because when you marry, if you're a widow or you're a single woman, and you own any property as a widow or a single person, you lose that property. It's your husband's now. And there were no laws to protect the stepchildren. Uh, Darkest Willard had children by Henry Willard. Two of them moved to Lunenburg. It became very important in early Lunenburg. But there were no protections in law that said the stepfather has to make sure that the kids from the first marriage get anything. Um, and so you have Dorcas and Benjamin now having four children, three girls and a son. The son was the youngest, Benjamin Bellows Jr., the second, was the youngest. Um, they come to Lunenburg. Um, Yes, I want the third generation is Joseph, who's the one who lives in the house during the Revolution. Enter. Okay, where are the Bellows? Well, because when the Bellows move, when Benjamin brings his wife, Dorcas, and the four kids to Lunenburg, he doesn't buy anything. He's still selling all this land that he's gotten in Lancaster, but not buying anything in Lunenburg. Why wouldn't he buy land? Land was what made you wealthy because there wasn't any circulating medium. There wasn't any cash, really, unless you were a very wealthy person. Um, it's possible that people wouldn't sell them land because he was illegitimate and that he carried that with him. Um, so we don't know where they were living when they first come, but they had lots of relatives. Uh, the oldest girl married a man named Moses Gould, who lived up on Flat Hill, over where the orchards are and the uh, Flat Hill Orchard building is in that general area. And then their daughter Joanna married a man named Ephraim Weatherby that Bill mentioned. And Ephraim Weatherby was like this guy who was always buying land. He bought all the land from Main Street on eastern side of Lancaster Avenue all the way down to uh, Rolling Acres <coughs> for what were called house lots. Anyways, uh, and he marries Benjamin's daughter, Joanne. Joanne. Uh, Benjamin Bellows II marries the minister's sister, Abigail Stearns. He's Reverend David Stearns. So all these families, of course it's a small town. Everybody knows everybody else. You've got to marry somebody. So, you know, you've got to marry somebody who's there. Uh, so they all are, you know, getting sort of related to each other. Okay, now what did I put in this? These are my old slides. Uh, okay, so we don't know where they're living. But then there's this little thing in the town records where they are talking about getting schools. And in 1736, they mentioned Benjamin Bellows' house. So he has a house, he's living somewhere, you know. Um, and 
What had happened was, was that one of those lots that even Weatherby has, he sells to Reverend David Stearns, who he's related to too. And in the deed it says, I'm selling this to the Reverend David Stearns except for three acres north of the meeting house. And with, I'm also reserving the land for a road that is going to go through that lot, Main Street. And that is exactly where the Bellows House eventually is built. Now, they're calling it Benjamin Bellows House. So I'm assuming, without really a whole lot of proof, absolute definite proof, that that is this building over there, not this one. But <laughs> yeah. the, the first part um, that Bill was showing up. Um, the other thing that probably speaks to the fact that Benjamin Bellows the first was, was sort of ostracized was that he never has any town offices. Here's a rich man. Usually rich man arrives in a colonial town and oh, they glom on him and they start electing him to select men and so on. If he's respectable. Benjamin Bellows of God never served in any town kind of office. The son, Benjamin Bellows too, he starts getting some offices. It's kind of looking like they're grooming him maybe. He, he's on the tra trajectory that most young men would follow. I think the first, um, now, inholder is a name that you put on your deeds to tell who you are. It's not a town office. You live in an inn. You own an inn. Um, but Benjamin Bellows Jr., number two there, um, he gets elected to offices, but they're kind of crummy offices, like constable. Nobody wanted to be constable. And they would pay a fine to get out of it. <laughs> so somebody else would have to do the job. Um, surveyor highway sounds like kind of a great deal, but surveyor highways, everybody was a surveyor of highways. If you were a guy and you lived in a neighborhood where they had to repair the road, put in a road, you were elected along with probably 10, 15, 20 other people to be a surveyor of highways that year. And it was your job to get your oxen over there and your cats and uh, do the work, and they would do that in exchange for tax money, for pay taxes, so, now. Yeah. Um, fence viewer, that was another great job. You had to mediate between people who lived next to each other about their fences, and who was going to do what part of the fence, or you had to talk to somebody who wasn't taking care of their fences, because fences are really important. The animals, a lot of the animals just roam free, particularly pigs. Hogs had to wear these triangular uh, collars, wooden collars, <laughs> so that they could not get through the Virginia rail fences that were used at that time. Um, and there's a picture of it. You know, it's a great picture. It's hot. It's a collar on it. You know. Um, so. Fence viewer wasn't so great. The other thing he was elected to do was he was on a committee to take care of the school and provide a schoolmaster. Well, I, you know, I think he was probably sweeping the school or something, but, you know, um, and he had to go around and find somebody who would teach because from the very beginning, schools were mandated as part of the branch of for the town. Um, but he, Benjamin Bell's also owns a couple of mills. And this plays into the idea that he probably built his own house. Um, it would have been sawmills, and the kind of saws they had in those days were up and down saws. And if you look at the timber frames, these massive timber frames that were used to build houses and meeting houses and barns, you can still see some of them today. You'll see these striations along the big timbers where the up and down blade was cut. So that's kind of interesting when you look at some of these old uh, frames, these house frames. Um, so he owns two mills, one on Pearlville Brook, which is probably the place near White Street. Um, there's a brook that runs across there, and then it runs down across to A and through Mappies, along Mappies. That's Pearlville Brook. And then Malpas Brook, um, he owned a mill probably 
You know, where the um, snow will be able, people have built that. If you're driving down Hanson Highway Road and the dam is on your left, and you look to the right, and it's a pond, that was a mill pond, and there's a beaver den, or whatever they call it. I should know, I went to the beaver program the other day. Uh, which is great, by the way. And um, right there, there's a little falls, and what looks like an old road that leads down to where the falls come over. It's not huge, but that must have been the mill pond at one time. Uh, several people own that on and all this road. Okay. Enter. Okay, so they stay, the fellows family really stays in Winterberg for a while. Um, but then in 747, the mother, Dorcas, Hutter, Lily, fellows dies. And remember, she has Willie children and she has Bella's children in Lumberg. Uh, there's Captain Josiah Willard, who is really one of the most important people in the settlement of Lumberg, and his brother, his younger brother, Jonathan, who now Josiah also had a mill. He had the first one in Lumberg, and he lived at the corner of Kilburn and Lancaster <coughs> Avenue. And there's a brook there, you probably see the pond out behind the house, and it goes under the road. In those days, we had a bridge or a causeway to take you over that brook. Um, and Jonathan lived, when you are on Page Street from the cemetery, and you come up to Lancaster Avenue, there's a great big house right across the street. He lived there. It wasn't probably that house, that's a newer house. But the interest, you would expect the house to be facing the road, wouldn't you? But all of those houses in early, in the colonial period, most houses and meeting houses faced south. The front door was in on the long side, just like you know the thing, the pictures. But in the meeting house, the meeting house was on the long side. The door, double doors usually were in the front. On the south side, on the north side was the pulpit facing those doors. But it's, why they chose to orient them towards the south. I don't know, women had their gardens, their vegetable gardens, right in front of the house. And it makes sense, you have that microclimate from the house, the sun warming it up and so on, uh, for your vegetable garden. And she could step right out the door, uh, off when the house didn't have a back door, so she'd be stepping out and having the kids go out there to weed and so on. Anyways, I digress. <laughs> <laughs> But they leave. The, the father, now it's weird about the father, Benjamin Bellows I. He either dies in 1743 or 1750. Uh, in 1754, the son, Benjamin Bellows II, leaves Lundberg and he's pursued by the sheriff. And the family history say, oh, he's standing at the border of New Hampshire and the sheriff is in Worcester County, and he's saying to him, I don't want to go to jail. I don't want to spend my time in jail. Well, why is he being pursued? Well, Jonathan Willard, his stepbrother, had brought a suit against him. And I don't know what it's for, but he got a lot of 1,000 pounds, which was a huge amount of money at that time. And they start, they have the sheriff starts taking his lands in Lunenburg. Um, Benjamin Bellows lands. So he takes his family, he goes up to New Hampshire. And this is not a great time to go to New Hampshire or any place because it's the middle of the French and Indian War. <laughs> and, um, but he goes up there and it says, the family says they first resided in some kind of a blockhouse or stockade. And I just picked this up off the internet. I thought it was a kind of a cool, you know without the glass in it, that was naturally. Plate uh, glass wasn't big in those days or anything. And then it's a little historical, so I don't even know where this is. But they lived in something like that for a while. And the place where they settled was called Bellows Town. And then it became Walpole, New Hampshire. Has anybody ever been to Walpole, New Hampshire? It's a lovely little town. And we have a, we have a little connection with Walpole. Um, a couple of years ago, we at the Circle Society discovered that third meeting house, which is the town hall now, 
The plans and elevations for that were done by a girly architect named uh, Asher Benjamin from Boston. We have a receipt that he signed uh, when, we, when Luther Firewell of Blue River paid for the plans and elevations. Uh, and a fellow who lives in Walpole has done a book on Asher Benjamin. And he came down and we looked at the town hall, just compared it with. There are lots of other churches built by Asher Benjamin in Massachusetts and so on. So that's kind of interesting. Um, so they settle on the frontier. Bellows Town becomes Walpole, New Hampshire, and enter. <laughs> OK, again, this uh, is our place here. And if you take off this gable in the front, in the porch, this is the original. And this is very typical, like Bill said, of the mansion houses that were built at that time. I think a lot of deeds mention mansion houses, but I don't know what a mansion house is. I'm assuming they were two-story houses rather than a single story. But I talked to genealogists at NEHGS in Boston and the Mass Historical Society, and none of them can pin down and tell me exactly what a mansion house means. But a lot of these will say a mansion house with barn, orcharding, you know, corn barns, cider mills. Anyway, so they, um, so they're up in New Hampshire for a while, and then evidently Benjamin Bellows, he's around 20, I think he's born in 74. He comes back to Lunenburg for some reason. We don't know why, but first, record we have of him is, of course, he's living in this house. It's an inn. He's an inn holder. He's got a big barn next door, and he's caring for the minister's horse. Well, at this time in Lunenburg, David Stearns, the minister we mentioned before, had just died. And they were trying to find a minister. They found a minister. Um, he was a young guy, loved mathematics, died after, like, four or five months after he was, you know, became the minister of Bloomberg. My town was not happy. <laughs> he had become engaged to David Stern's daughter, which was typical. Uh, the new minister would marry into the family, a minister's family. Uh, and they had, the town had to decide, he, they made the contract, okay? Were they going to pay Elizabeth Stearns the money that her to be husband had contracted for, and they did. But you could tell from the records they were not happy about <laughs> having to pay that money. Um, so Joseph comes back in 17, about 1764. He marries a woman named Lois Whitney, who's the daughter of Salmon Whitney, who's the daughter of Moses Whitney, uh, son of Moses Whitney. Um, and then in 1771, Benjamin Bellows up in the second, up in Fellows Town, Walpole, gives all his land in Lunenburg to Joseph. Um, 350 acres, Joseph buys at least another 200 acres, which, by the way, was every town that was established had land set aside for schools, for the meeting house, for the minister's land, for his farm, and also for Harvard College. <laughs> 200 acres worth. Uh, I think it was seen as a way of supporting these institutions by selling land eventually. And he buys the Abbott College lands in western and eastern Lunenburg over near Hunting Hill. Um, okay, so and he seems to be accepted. Of course, the Willards are all dead by now. There are a few younger Willards, but Jonathan, who sued his father, is dead. Josiah has gone to Fort Dummer in Vermont, um, and he is that dead uh, by then. So there's nobody carrying on the issues about not giving the stepchildren the money. That's what I think it was all about, but I can't prove that. Anyways, but he is accepted. The town starts electing him. The first one, he's elected as assessor. Used to be select an assessor, but then they separated them. And he's constable, tax collector, selectman, school committee, moderator of the town meeting once. He builds a school in the middle of the 
town on his property, and the town pays him for it. Then the American Revolution comes, and he has a subordinate, this guy that works for him, named Fowler. And there were a bunch of Fowlers in Williamsburg, as and Beale and Cheever, and we don't know which one it was. But he's going out buying things, and of course, during the Revolution, the economy was just crazy, even a long time after the Revolution. Inflation, all, you know, people were losing money, and evidently this, what, what he, what uh, an assistant would do is he would take a letter to these people he was buying stuff from that was signed by St. Joseph Bellows, who's a rich person, and he's guaranteeing that it would be paid. They're not bringing money, but they're bringing this guarantee. And the, the economy goes, and the guy has bought a bunch of stuff, and Joseph can't cover it, and he loses his money. And evidently, the doctor comes to see him and tells Lois he's hopelessly insane. <laughs> well, you know, I guess if you're you know, really rich and you lose a lot of money, you know, it's tough. Um, so he leaves Lundberg, and he ends up, and the town postpones his taxes with a bunch of other people who are having a hard time. Um, but because probably his land was being seized by somebody, the town takes the school that Joseph had built on his property and takes it right off the property, moves it right off, which was not uncommon. Houses were always being moved in this time, that period. And then in, 19, in 1794, the town uh, votes to sue him for his back taxes. Joseph, sue Joseph, fellows, back taxes. He is of course, up in New Hampshire. They start a new town right next to Walpole named Langdon, and that, he seems to have been put in London. Uh, maybe he was crazy, I don't know. So, um, but now I want to get, you got one here. Okay, so what did he do in the revolution? Um, and we don't know if there was a lot going on in this particular house during the revolution. The town meeting warrants usually would say where the town meeting was going to be held, whether it was in the new meeting house or the old meeting house or in but they stopped doing that during the Revolution Room, but they don't say where the meetings are being held, and whether this was because they were afraid somehow that the British would get rid of it and arrest them. Or actually the town meetings were made illegal by the British military governor. Um, before the revolution. So when they stop having them again, um, it's illegal. But um, so it's not impossible that they were having town meetings in the inn, um, in Ben and Joseph Bellows in this house. But we don't know that for sure. What does he do? He's on a lot of committees in the town. Money for soldiers' salaries. He's finding that because it's hard to find ready money. He's procuring beef, and they had a big argument in the town. So we send them actual beef, or they ended up sending them money for the beef. For the soldiers in the Continental Army. And uh, he's also on a committee to check the town arms and ammunition. He's, you know, he's really been accepted as an important person before he has his breakdown. Uh, but his military service, rich people, Important people seem to get jobs in the military, uh, ranks in the military, without having done a heck of a lot sometimes. <laughs> um, his service included, in 1775, um, he was a lieutenant in the Lemonster Militia. I, Lemonster, I don't know. And they responded to the alarm at Lexington and Concord. Um, and that meant they rode down to Lexington, Concord, and went into Boston, and some of them stayed there for a while. He's paid for his 12 days of service. Um, then in 1776, he's a captain in the Massachusetts Militia of the Lunenburg Company, the service of nine days, and he's paid for that. And then he becomes a second major, I don't know what that is, but he marches on the alarm to both Bennington and Saratoga separately, and it's a total service of 34 days for those two things. But he's always coming to these things. I think for Bennington, he might have actually been there during the 
data, but it's the records that I'm using are the um, Massachusetts and the American Revolution, um, the military records, and it doesn't really specify real well. So he has like a total of what? The 43, 53, 55 days or something like that, total service, but he ends up with a very high rank. But he's supplying stuff, you know, he's a, and that's what his brother Benjamin Bellows heard up in Walpole was doing here, a long list of soldiers that Benjamin Bellows who becomes a general. You know, he's supplying the out. You know, plus they're making money doing this. <laughs> so, but at, anyways, I just got this picture on the way to Saratoga. You know, he's riding out there. That's not him. None of the pictures there. You know, I just have that. <laughs> uh, questions? <laughs> okay. Okay. Are there any still at home? <laughs> I, I don't have a question, but I, when this was the American Legion, I spent a lot of time there because my dad was on the Legion. Yeah, what did it look like? Um, that first floor, which is not a cellar or whatever, was, really? was, it was where the, um, the bar was. It was a little <laughs> bar. My dad was a bartender. <laughs> and he would go up to the third, third floor to bring the poker players and pool players their beers. There was a refrigerator, there was a jukebox. And, and this was in the basement? Yeah. And what about, about what year would this have been or around? I don't the know. The 60s maybe? Or? Yeah, in the 60s. Because we yeah. had a young British, young English girl. Yeah. Who, I, are you familiar with that story? She was an English girl who must have maybe been an exchange student in 1963. And she wrote a report on the house and she took all of these pictures. And we had that report, or Sue had at it. And unfortunately, when they copied the report, the pictures became all blurred, so you couldn't see them. But she describes them also what the house looked like. And she mentions that you go in the front door, and there's a room on the left mm -hmm. and a room on the right. The room on the right is where the credit union was. And my dad was, they needed 10 people to have a credit union. He had 12 or 10, which I still have, which is the only reason I made the workers credit union. <laughs> <laughs> it went a lot of other people. Like it. <laughs> and, then, and there was a kitchen before you go downstairs. And then the second floor was where the credit union was, and the room on the side was where we had the summer activities with. Yep. Yeah, the night. If you have any pictures, and then you would like to get was where the pool players were, and the yeah. room, you know, three rooms. But there were these little cubby holes, little doors. And my dad said that that's where they would hide people from the underground. Oh, that's yes, and then that's very true. We were talking about this the other day. Yeah, I'm not with that, but that's yeah, what well, you we know, told us. So. It's a family story. Yeah. Also, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there were these little. You could open the door and see. There, so. Well, you know, it's amazing. Some of these stories do have, you know, some I don't basis, know it's, yeah, but it's, it's really hard to separate them out, you know. Yeah. But yeah, any pictures anybody has of the building, inside or outside, we would love to see. I think we have yeah, yeah. Um, it's just. Also, there is a Bellows Falls. Bellows Falls right next to Welcome because my great grandmother right. was married up there. Exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah, it was named after the Bellows family. In fact, the road going into Walpole is Bellows Road. And uh, up there at Walpole was Fort Number Four. Oh, of course, yes. Right. And Great. Joseph was one of the builders of that. Oh, okay, because um, a whole lot of people from Lunenburg went to Fort Number Four. The Farnsworth brothers. And they were all married to the Hastings girls who lived on Hot Hill Road. Um, they needed land. Oh, yeah, absolutely. They had very poor fertilizing farming abilities. Right. And land was wealth. It was the main source of wealth for most people. Mm -hmm. You know, you were valued on what you owned and what you owned. Um, We had a fellow come in the other day who was interested. He was a Willard family descendant. And so we were talking about, you know, all the land that the Willards owned. And, you know, the, there are so many records that haven't been searched. For example, Simon Willard was a judge for a long, long time. And the judges went uh, around from town to town. There were different levels of courts, but uh, 
his judicial records are out there. Uh, the first minister of Bloomberg was a man named Ian Gardner. And I happened to run his name through the Mass Historical Society online uh, catalog. And up popped, in connection with Andrew Gadd and Benjamin Prescott, who was a justice of the peace in Broughton, in the very beginning of Bloomberg. And everybody says Andrew Gadd was kind of a crazy minister, and we got rid of him really fast. But also, part of that was that a resident of Bloomberg named Benoni Boynton accused Andrew Gadd's wife of having a child with the next door neighbor, John Goodrich. And Andrew Gardner, his, you know, her husband, Reverend Andrew Gardner, took him to court and, you know, he was, I think he was fined five pounds and told, don't do that anymore. You know, stop talking about the minister's wife, not, not kosher. You know, so, but, you know, it's a wonderful period to read about and we have, we also have at the Historical Society a lot of the town records, the loose ones, original manuscript records that tell about Bloomberg from its, almost from its founding. They're kind of slim down in the 1730s, but they start getting more and more voluminous. And as the years go by, we have records about um, Bloomberg, what was going on in the town during the American Revolution. And it's so exciting to read those things. It's just, you know, your eyes are popping out of your head when you see these things. But, um, but I would encourage anybody, if you're, you know, if you just want to uh, volunteer for a couple hours a week, we're very flexible. Um, we're a great group. We're very friendly. <laughs> um, Bill and uh, Pat have done the most wonderful job in reorganizing and you know we're moving ahead in a steady manner thanks to them. Bill is tireless in the amount of work he does there and Pat is, is really the inspiration for the inventory to a great degree because he, he's done a lot of that with his own uh, interests and not instruments and we are just so blessed. I've been there about 12 or 13 years, and I am so excited about how we are starting to do more stuff and trying to get involved more in the community. So we're not pressuring anybody, but if anybody would be interested, we have lots of cost of clothing. If you're into, like textiles, you can do quilting. We have some old quilts, and all of these things need to be taken care of and put into the inventory and described and we have all kinds of household items and military items and all of that has to be re-inventory and you know um, it's not difficult to do but you know a couple of hours a week we would be very happy to have we have two wonderful volunteers and is one of them she is doing all the books, and when I say books, I'm talking about uh, old account books, all kinds of things, and she's working away every week. And uh, we also have a bond here who's doing the maps. We have some old maps and stuff, and, but they're a lot more than you'd ever expect. But, you know, um, if you're interested, we'd love to have you. <laughs> well, I'm supposed to be doing the yeah. inventory. What I'm really doing is reading. <laughs> I was just going to say that Ann does a, a book inventory, and it's funny because it's so easy to get sidetracked when you're doing something because you know, you pick up a book and just you know, can, can try to log it in, and next thing you know, half an hour later, it's like, <laughs> 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 but, that, but that's the fun part about it. You never know what you're going to find. I found things about my family that in some you know, obscure receipt, my you know, great grandfather's name, it's just it's cool. So I don't encourage, like what Eileen said, anybody wants to spend some time, we have... Uh, We're very flexible. Yeah. <laughs> we, we have a lot of scanning that needs to be done. Uh, we have a lot of documents. Uh, yeah, 18, we'll show you how to do it. 18, I don't know how to do it yet, but, you know. 18th century tax records that we were trying to uh, digitize because of the original records. Um, things like that. So there's uh, all kinds of things you can do. Um, you know, all the artifacts, they have to be cleaned once in a while. So. Feel free to stop by and we'll, we'll put you to work for sure. <laughs>
The other thing is, I'm not a <laughs> I didn't grow up here. I had nobody buried me in the cemetery. I'm just interested in history and old things. I mean, so that's why I went over. So uh, the house that we lived in, that I lived in as a child, was on West Street. And then we moved to Lemonster Road in fourth grade. But I remember my parents saying that that house was moved from someplace and put there. And I can't remember if it was moved from Sunny Hill or down like Lancaster, uh, Mass Ave, across from kind of where Mackey's is on the other side of the street. Yeah. Is there something there that might say where that house? If I if I knew uh, if you give me the address of where it is now. Um, it, it's not the same house there now. Whoever recently, yeah. you know, in the past few years bought it, they, they put a big house there, but the address was 111 West Street. Right. And it was just a small house. Is that where it was originally, or that's where it is now? That's where it, where I lived when it was there, and I don't know where it was moved from to okay. be there. Yeah, I mean, it might take some time. You'd have to do some backtracking. A lot of the, a lot of the requests we get about house research because people move into these houses and they want to know. You know, of course, it's a little more valuable maybe in some people's eyes if it's older. You know, but it probably would. We have. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Bill Bingham. And uh, Barry Whitcomb. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, they both did amazing research, house research, on the houses, and you know, we love to get into that stuff. It's really interesting, and it shows the deeds for each. Um, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, house lots originally, but then they start breaking up and was broken up. They're 45 acres to begin with, and they break them up and. Yeah, but it's all over the universe. So. It, it probably would yeah. require a deed search of some sort. If you want to stop by and yeah. read some just basic information, we can certainly do and that. And we can yeah. show you how to get into the, like, the Worcester Deeds, the Registry of Deeds. They have a website. You can do your own research. It's not that hard. You know, we have access. We have computer access. And we have a very good addition of ancestry for genealogical research, too. And I don't want to start to do that, but you're a little nervous. I'm in. I'm thrilled to help you. Ian is, Ian is a fantastic well, genealogist. She, we, it's an obsession. <laughs> oh, <it's> wonderful. <laughs> we had a fellow in Lundberg during the revolution named Dr. John Taylor. And for years, we tried to figure out where he was from. Ian discovered by going into the deeds and finding his father's name. The father was from Townsend. And you know, he was like a total mystery. But that's genealogy is wonderful for helping, you know, this, you know, people interested in history. So, you know, it's uh, it isn't just your family, it's like all of these people who, you know. So. Well thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed the uh they call me the the program. Media digression <laughs> <laughs> the historical society. <laughs> You're, you're dismissed. <laughs>